In this video, I'm talking once again to Martin Ball. Now, I first spoke to Martin towards the end of 2020, and we had a conversation on the subject of 5-MeO DMT and non-duality. And it was a conversation I very much enjoyed, and that was pretty much that, or so I thought. But within the last week or so, another channel called Symposia released a video which focused on several of Martin's anecdotes and highlighted just how weird some of these events sound. And yeah, I mean, they definitely sound weird, and I don't think anyone would dispute that. And certainly my reaction when I watched that symposium video was that, yeah, I found it pretty shocking. The other thing, though, was that the video contained a very small and almost unrecognisable clip of me. But many people did spot that it was me and made that connection, and so asked for my opinion on it. So I kind of got pulled into this topic. Now, I just want to be clear here that I have no problem at all with Symposia using my clip. You know, us YouTubers do that all the time. It's absolutely fine. So I'm not interpreting this as Symposia trying to start some sort of beef with me. And likewise, I don't have any grievance with them. That said, I went and watched the source material from which Symposia made their piece to see if it would shed some light on Martin's practices. And it did, and it kind of became clear but I think Symposia had created a very bad faith interpretation of the events being described. And in my opinion, it was overblowing certain elements to make them sound more shocking than they actually were. Still, some of what was described I certainly would not want done to me while I was under the influence of 5-MeO-DMT. So I had some questions for Martin and I wanted to give him the opportunity to publicly respond. So I reached out to him and we had a chat about it and here it is. And I think this conversation really fills out the context. So whatever your opinion of Martin and his practices, at least now you'll have the full picture. We cover all the major beats here of the symposium video and some additional stuff. So we talk about vomiting on people, touching people in ways that might be considered inappropriate. We talk about people having violent reactions to 5-MeO DMT. And also some of the comparisons that have been made between Martin and Octavio Rettig, who many of you will know is someone I've called out for his own controversial practices. Now I appreciate that this is quite a long conversation and that rather than sit through it in one go, you might just be curious about how Martin answers specific questions. So I'll put timestamps to each topic in the description below so you can dive straight to the bit that interests you. But if you do get the chance though, then please check out the full thing. I had some personal insights during this conversation, which made me realize just how weird some of my own experience has been on things like ayahuasca retreats. But that them being weird doesn't necessarily make them bad or dangerous. And that if I'm making a sovereign decision about my own experience, then that's something I should have the liberty to do, regardless of how weird it sounds. So, okay, with all that said, without further ado, I bring you Martin Ball. So I'm here once again with Martin Ball. And the reason being is that many people reached out to me in the light of the recent video from the channel Symposia, because it contained a, a very brief clip of me and they wanted to know what my take or involvement was on that video, which really focused on Martin and some of his practices as a psychedelic facilitator, specifically around 5-MeO DMT. And I think it's fair to say that the video in question was critical of Martin and that it was edited in a way to provoke uh, a fairly visceral reaction within the viewer. And I think that reaction would be something along the lines of like, holy shit, this is really weird. This guy can sound completely nuts. And... I think based on that video, that under, that reaction is fairly understandable. I don't think it's entirely fair, though, to, to form a conclusion based just off that video. So that's why I wanted to have this conversation. And I want to lay out what the purpose of this conversation is for the benefit of the audience. So I don't think this is from my side anyway. This is not really intended to be like a rebuttal of that symposium video, but really just to facilitate the bigger conversation about what's described there. Because I think this is one of those situations where context is really important. And I want to say up front that I, I think I'm fairly impartial here. Now, obviously, I spoke to Martin just a few months ago, but it's not like I'm a client of his or that we are lifelong friends. Really, the sort of entirety of our relationship is that previous conversation, which anyone can go and watch. And likewise, I don't have any connection to or particular grievance with Symposia. Uh, they use that little piece of footage from me. I'm absolutely fine with that, you know, fair use and all that. And I think they sort of they didn't seem to go out of the way to sort of anonymize me within that clip. So um, I guess they just like the soundbite. Um, but I'm saying all this anyway, not because I want to distance myself from Martin or from Symposia, but just because I want to stress that I am impartial here. I'm neither pro nor against any of these guys. And the role that I'm trying to carve out here on YouTube is that of someone who's looking at psychedelic culture 
through the eyes of an ordinary person. You know, I'm not a guru. I'm not an investigative journalist. I'm not deep into this spiritual practice or that one. And if anything, I've built up a bit of a reputation as a skeptic who calls out bad practice or ideas. And I'm perfectly happy to do that today. So there's no particular bias or agenda on my part. But what I do think is important here is that there is a conversation. And that's why I reached out to Martin, because on the one hand, I can understand people's reaction to that symposium video. And there's definitely some stuff that's mentioned in there that I don't agree with personally. But on the other hand, I don't think it's a good faith interpretation of the original lecture. So the only real sort of goal here is to have a conversation, to add some context. And the ballast that I want us to all have in our tanks here is grounded rationality. And let's see where we get to. And uh, with that in mind, Martin, how shall we how shall we skin this cat? Uh, I think there's, there's various ways we can go at this. Um, I, I think it's probably important that we hit like the main beats of that symposium video because um, they, they sort of timestamp certain things which they seem to have um, issue with. And I think there's an, another one that's kind of implied in the. Um, so, yeah, I mean, is, is there any particular way you want to sort of go at this or shall we just work through it as in it sort of sequentially? Well, first, I just want to start by saying thank you for inviting me to be on your podcast and, and actually have a conversation about this. That um, I was initially contacted by Symposia by this guy, Russell, saying that, you know, he was working on an article on abusive practices of um, psychedelic facilitators and therapists. And he had a number of questions from the video. and. I responded to his questions, but essentially the questions that he was asking me, all the answers to those questions were in the original video itself. So I don't know if that really added anything to it. And then he sent me a few follow-up questions and I provided him with some more materials. And my impression of the original email was that it was clearly aggressive and hostile. I mean, it, it, was, it was quite clear from the message like, oh, these guys are not looking to say anything good about me, but they've asked me for information, so I will provide that information with them. And I've always prided myself on being open, available. You know, if they, they have their own podcast, if they wanted to bring me on and talk about it, I would make myself available for that. I would also note that at this point, I have reached out both to Russell and to another person um, associated with Symposia, inviting them to come on my podcast to talk about it. And they have not responded to my emails. Just one of them left a comment on my Facebook page saying, we are not going to engage with you on your platform. Um, and so then actually earlier today, I wrote down a long list of questions that I had for Russell. And I mm -hmm. said, you sent me questions and I responded. Here are my questions for you. Um, now, I do want to just talk about the original video for just a moment, and sure. then I'm more than happy to get into any of the specifics that are in there. So the original video uh, was recorded by the Los Angeles Medicinal Plant Society, and it was held on the UCLA campus. I think it was in 2016 was when that was mm -hmm. recorded. And it's a, it's a rather long video. It's a two and a half hour long video, um, which even there, you know, they say, well, we provided a link to the original video. I'm not sure how many people are going to click through and watch a two and a half hour video that if you're presenting an 11 minute summation of the video. Um, but anyway, in giving that talk, I was invited because um, one of the people associated with LAMPS actually had done a session with me and he was quite impressed by the session that he had with me and he, they invited me to talk about it and by that point in time that I gave that talk I think it's important to note that everything that is mentioned in that talk is in the past tense that I had retired from giving sessions at that point and I have not given any sessions since that time that I am fully retired and I will also say that, you know, as you can see by even watching their little 11 minute video, I am in a, a very enthusiastic public speaker. I am, I'm not passive. I don't just sit around. I walk around a lot. I make a lot of big gestures with my body. 
I do a lot of stuff with my voice. I play different characters. Um, I enjoy it. I enjoy mm -hmm. being a public speaker. And it's actually something that goes all the way back to childhood. I got into theater and I've always enjoyed it. Um, so in, in that talk, what I'm doing is basically for the very first time, I'm sharing what were really outstanding outstanding events that happened within my practice that I thought were worthwhile to share, as well as also giving the general overview of just what it was. And it's also something that I've, I've always said that it's gonna be really difficult for anyone from outside to understand what it is mm -hmm. that I do with people and what I'm talking about. And I understand that it can sh sound really shocking and it can sound really, really bizarre. And I want to emphasize that that's what I was communicating in that video is that this was shocking to me as well, which is why yeah. I'm sharing. I mean, things. I think I, that was one of the, the things which is, is kind of very obvious from the original video. And I think is, is lacking in, the, in this, the symposium one is that one of the first things you say in the full length is like, you're right, knowledge of how absolutely fucking weird that these, these are like the weirdest sort of situations. I mean, that's kind of what we do when we do talks like that. We don't just recount through the, all the mundane ones. We we you bring up the sort of the weird events, and yeah, and I think that piece of framing is is missing. And I think the the other piece of framing which is bundled around it is the title of advice for psychedelic guides by Dr. Martin Ball, as though this right. is actually this is the the day to day playbook which I, again, I thought was a little bit uh, disingenuous, uh, but so carry on around, around the original lecture. Yeah, so the original lecture itself, um, you know, I agreed to let them film it. I agreed to let them post it. And somewhat ironically, I mean, it's been out for about five years now. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard from lots of people about that video. And the number one thing that I hear from people who have watched that video is, please, will you come out of retirement so that you can work with me? I've watched this video. I understand that you get it. You go inside the experience with people and that you have a level of working with them that is unparalleled. And please, will you work with me? And I literally get an email almost once a week from people who have watched that video. Mm -hmm. And it's also very common. It's, it's, a, it's a common place that people cite for why they reach out to me for a consultation about their own 5-MEO experience or their experience with other psychedelics. And they say, you know, I watched that video and it really made me feel that you get it and that you've been there with people. And that's mm -hmm. why I trust you to, to talk to you about this. And everyone also says, I definitely would not want to be vomited on. And I say, well, of course, no one wants that. No one wants that. And then I always tell them, it's like, you know, it only happened a couple of times, but I've always felt it was worthwhile mentioning because just like everyone else, right, you would assume that vomiting on someone would be taken as just the most vile, disgusting thing ever. Yet, on the few rare instances that it happened, the people that it happened to expressed gratitude and appreciation for it. And, and, you know, we can spend a lot of time talking about vomiting because there was a lot of vomiting that took place in the sessions that I did, both by myself and by my clients. And it was, it was a main feature of something that occurred. So that's just kind of the background on the video itself. And since that time of that video, I mean, I've given dozens and dozens and dozens of interviews talking about all of the same stuff. So none of this is really new. And, you know, as I also pointed out to the people at Symposia, you know, my 2017 book, Entheogenic Liberation, this is the full manual of everything mm -hmm. that I did within my sessions. Um, and even, you know, when it gets to that part about advice, um, you know, the title that they gave it for the video that I, I sent them. Um, there's a chapter here in Entheogenic Liberation that is almost a verbatim 
transcript of the talk that I would give with mm -hmm. each and every one of my clients before I ever worked with them. And so when it gets to the question of advice, like the, this, the chapter is being a non-dual energetic practitioner. And that mm -hmm. was a distinction that I made with Symposia. I said, no, I'm not just talking about psychedelic therapy. I'm talking about a unique methodology that I developed that I called non-dual energetic therapy. And people can disagree whether therapy is the right term mm -hmm. or not. But the very first sentence of the chapter is the chances that anyone reading this is qualified to be considered a full non-dual psychedelic therapy practitioner are slim. So I'm, I'm already acknowledging that what I'm referring to here is not something that I consider to be a general or average practice and that it's not certainly not for everyone. And that um, I think that it's something that you would have to, in, in my opinion, you'd have to go through what I went through in order mm -hmm. to be able to do it. And also what I think is um, significant about the video, because they, they produced the video in conjunction with um, going after Mark Hayden, who has just retired from being the executive director of MAPS Canada, because I helped produce a book for him called Manual for Psychedelic Guides. And I've got that book mm -hmm. right here. And if you notice, at the very beginning of the video, they show the cover of this book, and then they focus in on my name on the book. And they also included the video as part of their article of Mark Hayden retires after a year of controversy. And so they really seem to be tying my talk and my methods with what we did with this book. And there's zero relationship mm -hmm. at all between my own practice and this book. So th that's what I would mention about the original video itself. Yeah, and I think I'll just th throw in there that I, the, with the, the edited video, just uh, as you've described, there's no real smoking gun here. This is this is stuff that's very sort of been out there. And I think, as you say, if, if they'd asked you the questions, you, you would have sort of come up, come up with the same answer. So just, I, I appreciate that's not necessarily what Symposia may have been trying to do, but that, you know, when something new comes into the, the sphere, it does have this kind of appearance of, oh, wow, this is this is something, some un, you know archived piece of footage that's just been revealed where really it's, it's like I say, this is very sort of public, nothing that you wouldn't say um, or, or isn't, hasn't been available before. Yeah, and actually with, with the LAMPS video itself, that they have hosted a number of different talks mm -hmm. at UCLA. That video with me is their most watched video. It's, and so it's not like that was some kind of secret video that nobody had access to. And in terms of videos with me that are on YouTube, I think that it's the second most watched video. Mm -hmm. the, the most watched video with me is the interview that I did with Leo Guerra in 2015, I think yeah. it was. Yeah, so I think let, let's, it's probably good to just address then some of the, the, the sort of the, the key bits that, that pop up in that video. And uh, I think the first one that I want to just tackle is one which isn't actually stated by Symposia, but I, I certainly saw it floating up in the comments and stuff. And I thought this was one which was leaning towards hysteria. And so I think it's important that we bring the energy of that one down straight away. And sure. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but the, the overall gist of what is something along the lines of, um, is Martin a predator? Uh, you know, predator being sort of hot word of the, of the moment. And yeah. um, holy shit, the, the, this guy's on a par with Octavio Rettig. And for those of you who, who don't know, Octavio Rettig is another uh, practitioner of uh, sort of BUFO, 5-MEO DMT, who's been very controversial because some of his practices have sort of been seen as, as dangerous. I've done a ceremony with Octavio Rettig and I've also been very critical of Octavio Rettig because I think some of his practices just cross the line um, into sort of unethical. And yeah, so, so there was these comparisons between yourself and Octavio Rettig and I don't know what, what your stance is on Octavio, but from from where I'm sat, because I'm, I'm conscious that people are going to be thinking, oh God, this guy's just a massive hypocrite because he's been speaking out against Octavio, but now he's talking to Martin. First of all, I would happily talk to Octavio. I'll, I'll talk to anybody and, and, and facilitate these conversations and see what Octavio's got to say. But I think the, 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 
the comparison is just not fair to me. Octavio has, if the reports are to be believed, a body count attached to him. And there is a long list of people complaining, like ex-clients complaining about Octavio. And I don't think that's the case with yourself, Martin. From from what I've, you know, I, I did my sort of due diligence of Googling and I couldn't find a, a you know, this, you know, list of complaints or open letters against you. So um, I don't know if you've got anything to say around that topic, but I think, you know, for anyone who's making those comparisons, I think we just need to, yeah, they, they just don't stand up, I think. Yeah, well, that's been one of my starting points with symposia is I, as I asked them, it's like, well, do you have any accounts of anybody complaining about my work? Mm. And, you know, this, this puts me into somewhat of a difficult situation because it's not that I want to brag about my work, but in a sense, it kind of forces me to because what I have rather than anyone complaining about me or saying that I violated them or that I hurt them or that I harmed them is that I have person after person after person after person after person thanking me with heartfelt gratitude for the work that I did with them. And I even sent symposia, you know, early on in my practice, um, I had asked my clients uh, the people that I had worked with at that point, if they would be willing to provide a testimonial for working with me. And they did, and they were all glowing. And I sent those over to Symposia so that they could see those. And um, also, you know, they contacted, uh, of course, the people at LAMPS. Mm -hmm. And they also, you know, I actually, I have the letter that LAMPS wrote back to them. And I'll just address this really quickly. It says, um, we spoke with numerous people in the community about their sessions and feelings about Martin and his work and received mostly glowing feedback about him, both as an individual and as a practitioner. Many clients indicated that they felt him to be a man of good character, doing important, caring work. One of us had the pleasure of having a session with Martin prior to his re retirement, and the experience could be said to be life-changing. Later on, they say... Um, oh, actually, no, I don't need to get into that at the moment. Okay. Um, so in other words, I provided them with material and I said, you know, I have never received a complaint from anyone. I also pointed out to them that even in the examples that I give in the video, those people came back for more. That, for example, the 79-year-old woman that is mentioned, she considered that to be her pre-80th birthday present to herself. And she came back for two more sessions with me. And that also, because... I knew really early on. Now, first, let me say, I didn't learn my techniques from anyone. No one taught me any of this. I am not a trained therapist. I'm not a trained psychedelic facilitator. I have made my own way, that I learned all of this through discovery and through doing of it. And so as my practice developed very early on, and I realized like, okay, there's all these kind of weird things that are taking place that are really out of the ordinary. It's really unusual, and it's not what someone would necessarily expect when they're going for some kind of psychedelic therapy or psychedelic experience. So I created a PDF where I kind of outlined, here's all the ways that I might be interacting with you within our experience. I also provided that to Symposia, but I said this is not for public dissemination. So mm -hmm. I'm providing this to you out of uh, respect for your inquiries. Sure. And then I also had, uh, as I mentioned it, it, in Entheogenic Liberation, it was my one hour introductory talk that I would give to every new client that I had. And even there, I had a number of clients say, yeah, 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 I've, I read through the PDF. Can we just get to it? And I was like, no, no, we're going to go through all the details. And in general, my patients or clients, whatever we want to call them, they came to me with the idea of, I want the Martin Ball treatment. And yes, my practices sound really, really extreme. But again, it kind of puts me in this position where I have to speak highly of myself, um, that most of my clients felt that their work with me was the most profound work they had ever received in their lives. 
I had a number of people who also came to me who had had 5-MeO DMT experiences with other providers, and they were all in agreement that the work that they did with me was light years beyond what they had experienced in other contexts. And I even had two people independently. These were two different people who had had 5-MeO DMT experiences um, prior with people that I would consider to be providers which is a really standard method in the sense of someone provides you with the medicine, they provide mm -hmm. you with the space to have the experience, you have your experience all by yourself, and then you come out of it, and then they either help you integrate or, or not. So for me, that's, that's a provider, whereas mm -hmm. I'm describing myself as a practitioner. And these two people who had had these prior experiences, it was kind of funny because they actually said the exact same quote. They both said, what I got before in my previous 5-MEO experience was like kindergarten compared to working with you was going to graduate school. So those are the kinds of responses, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, I posted this to my Facebook page of the video and people are asking me like, well, given everybody's negative reaction to this video, does this make you question your work at all? And my response is, I base my work off of the responses of the people that I work with, not by people who are outside and creating sensationalized videos that are obviously designed to elicit an emotional reaction from people. And that's why I've also invited, I said, look, if anyone who has worked with me has any complaints, I invite you to step forward, share it with me, share it with Symposia, share it with anyone. And the opposite is what we've gotten so far is that a number of people who have worked with me, and I didn't ask anyone, I, did, I didn't go on a post and say, please, everybody who's worked with me, please mm -hmm. tell them how positive it was. A number of people have independently gone and left comments on these posts on Facebook and on YouTube saying that they had absolute respect and trust uh, in their experiences with me and felt that there was full disclosure of all of my methods, that there was full consent all the way along. So it, to me, it feels like a manufactured issue. Yeah. Personally, that's my take. Yeah, and I, and I think there's there's something there around. Um, there's two things I've been, I've been sort of trying to jostle with. One is just you know our sovereign control of ourselves as human beings. That if I'm, you know, if I am given the right information, like you, you talk about the information that you present with your clients and the talk that you have with them. Um, if I'm given that information, then I have, you know, I should have sovereign right to to agree to that or or, or not or to walk away. But then there, and there is another aspect that's that gets raised there, which is sort of people, and I think this is in light of a lot of the stuff that's happened in the sort of in the wider world culturally, where people are talking about the kind of the uh, the power dynamic and that can, can someone really consent there in in these situations because because you are the kind of the guru and you're up here and they're sort of looking up to you. And so it sort of, it opens the door to this kind of sort of predatory behavior. Now I will, I'm, go, I'm gonna say, I'm, I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate here because I don't, I do not think this is this is the case. And I think this is, like I said, I think this is one area where it's easy for us to kind of um, slip into hysteria. And it's very hard to defend against as well because I've seen people talking about well, they they don't know that they've that they've got a problem now, but they'll realise it in five years' time or something like that. So it's a very tricky thing to navigate. But I think, yeah, and that's why I think where the um, the statements from your clients, we've got to take them. I think at the value that there are because the, the, again, I, I I really did look into this and I could not find any anything to sort of negative and i think it would make for a far more interesting conversation if i did <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh, but uh, i i genuinely couldn't and and so i think we we can't there's something around us projecting or inventing you know some sort of um horror work where there isn't any and again i think that's just it I'm, I'm just really zeroing in on the kind of the predator sort of yeah uh, dangerousness of it here um so yeah i think let's put that one that's kind of one to one side. I think that's, like I say, I think that's pretty sort of baseless. And uh, let's move on to 
onto the, the vom onto the vom situ situation, which we, we touched on a little bit already. And uh, the sort of I think the the quote here that Simpos uses is uh, Ball discusses his enthusiasm for vomiting on people. Um, and I, I think I mean, I, I mean I mean when I watched the video, I mean I say there's some of the stuff that we're going to talk about tonight. I I personally dis disagree with, and I was like I'd, I'd be I probably would not want to go through a ceremony with like based on 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 some of this knowledge. But and and you, you watch the video, and again it do, it does provoke a reaction. It get, it came up with a visceral reaction. I mean I was like oh my god this is. This is bad. And then I, when I stopped and thought about it, particularly in the context of my own experiences, I was like, actually, you know, I've had I've had shamans burping in my face and spitting all over me. I've had, you know, the skin burnt off my arm and sort of frog venom rubbed into it. You know, I've you know I've been to like ecstatic dances, which have been you know pretty much just ended up in like orgies. You know, there's so much things out on the fringes of this kind of psychedelic and, and sort of inner work. Where that if you put it on on paper or or frame it in a certain light, there's not a lot that's not incredibly weird. Um, yeah. So, and that's where I think I, that's where when I sort of got my head around the sort of symposium video, and I, I just thought, no, there's the context is missing here because, yeah, sure, you I could, I mean, I, I I've seen like you know documentaries or, or piece, videos on YouTube say around you know iboga ceremonies where sort of, you know, s some woman who has cancer and she goes to this, uh, like, traditional Bwiti Yaborga ceremony and they're pushing root back down her throat. They're holding her nose and she's gagging and they're like, no more, and they're stuffing it down her throat. And then they're keeping her up and she's making a dance all night. She dances and she keeps falling over. But they get I could edit that into a horror story. Um, yeah. But we wouldn't, I think if I tried to do that, I'd get eviscerated because then I'd be I'd be a massive racist and I'd be sort of you know culturally ignorant and but it's and it, it's kind of but it is it's very fringe it's very sort of weird but we give it that kind of space because we kind of it's got the context it's got the context of a very yeah. extreme ceremony and I don't think there's any there's any disputing that you're operating in that same space of of something extreme on the fringes but it yeah. is from what I you know what I gather it is, it's consensual. This is sovereign adults. And I, it doesn't seem like there's any sort of, yeah, sh shenanigans necessarily going on there. Um, so yeah, so once I'd kind of framed that within my own experiences and managed to sort of bring myself down from the from the visceral reaction, uh, to be honest, the vomiting thing I thought was pro probably one of the, the things I had the least problem with. Uh, I was like, oh yeah, fine. You know, it, if, if a shaman did that to me, fine if that's you know if that's what comes up in the work but is there anything you want to sort of flesh out more around the, the vomiting topic yeah yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Go stuff I, I'd, I'd love to <laughs> it's, it's it's there's a lot of volume there um but first um i just want to touch on something that that you just said because this is actually something that kind of came to mind to me the other night was when you're an anthropologist and you're studying another culture and they have ways that are really different from yours, it is not considered ethical on the part of the anthropologist to judge those practices by their own standards and by their own culture. And we have kind of a weird situation here where essentially, because this is all a method and technique that I developed on my own, I'm essentially a culture of one. And that culture is not there, it does, it's not shared by anybody else except for the clients with whom I worked. And so that anybody from outside coming in and putting their own standards of what they think is proper or improper, I think is kind of along the lines of um, an anthropologist misrepresenting a culture that they're studying. And just like you say, like if you were to take video of Bawiti ceremonies and edit it in a way that is graphic, that is meant to evoke disgust and horror, that you would be called out for mm -hmm. it. Not, I mean, people might say, wow, Bawiti tradition is weird. I don't want anything to do with that. But um, the, the ethical violation would be on the part of the anthropologist who created something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that in, a, in its own way, that's a bit of what we're going through here 
Um, so anyway, let's talk about vomit. That actually. Well, can I can I just 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 make one one yeah, little point sure. before going to that? Is that I, I, what I think as well is that there's a bit of um, a kind of a layer here in the sort of psychedelic culture where we're, we're trying to have our cake and eat it as well because on the one hand, we're, we're you know psychedelics are kind of this is medicine this is healing we're we're sort of doing this and and then on on the other sort of hand we sort of we start imposing all these kind of western standards of a well you're not allowed to do this you're not allowed to do that yeah. you know and you know whereas you know if we went if if we really sort of um you know believed in, the, in these things as the kind of as the these you know healing things and that's you know people are coming with extreme traumas and so they need to release some sort of this energy or that the relationship with you is as a a healer then yeah i think that's i mean i have a relationship with my you know with my healers with be it whether it's a traditional sort of shaman or whether it's my gp and i've had my gp stick his finger up my ass you know i mean that's <laughs> how much more intimate do you want to get you know it's, yeah yeah so we, we can't have our sort of cake and eat it we can't say oh yeah no this is this is medicine and there's there's a healing thing going on but actually no um the, any, anybody who's not a gp can't touch people in, in these certain ways or can't do certain things i think we've again we're, we're in a sort of a a, a, a fringe of a fringe here where things get weird but anyway that just, just popped into my head let's let's go back to the vomiting <laughs> yeah so just vomiting in general is actually something that tended to happen with my clients with me probably at a higher proportion than in any other context of 5-MeO DMT um like it's interesting that I've had people you know because I do consultations, right? I talk to people on Skype, just like we're doing now, and we talk about their experiences. And I've had some people say that they have vomited on 5-MeO-DMT and that the person who provided them with the experience of 5-MeO-DMT, they say, that person said I was the first person who ever vomited. They'd never seen that before. They didn't know that people would vomit on 5-MeO-DMT. And look, for me, the way that I worked it was a very unique kind of context because not only was the client taking 5-MeO-DMT, I was taking it with them and for the express purpose of finding where do they have stuck energy that they need help processing out. And so for, for my session space, I had a mat on the floor and I had to have um, a waterproof cover on the mat and then I had towels placed at the head of the mat for people to lie down. And I learned this the hard way. I actually, so I would always sit at the very foot of the mat because this kind of spatial relationship that we have right now mm -hmm. is absolutely fundamental to the way that I work with people. There has to be this direct head on balance between us. And we also both need to be using bilateral symmetry within our bodies so that we can energetically sink in with right. each other. So anyway, I would sit at the mat and I learned the hard way that I also had to put a, a towel on the mat or at, at the foot of the mat where I would sit um, because so many people threw up and it was cathartic for them. It was part of the process. And so the, the towel that was at the head of the mat that was for, for when people lie down and then I would, I called this like the volcano where they'd lie back and all of a sudden they would just throw up and it'd get all over them. And then I had to put the towel where I sat because many of them would sit up, look right at me and then throw up on me. And so I had to have a towel there. And then for some clients I learned, oh, I actually have to place towels all the way around the outside of the mat for this client because they're gonna throw up. And, and this is one of the things that I would always talk about in my introductory talk with people. And it was also in the PDF that I sent people where I would say, no one ever wants to throw up. Nobody likes vomit. But what's happening in these sessions is that people are letting go of something that they feel ashamed of or something that they hate about themselves or some part of themselves that they've rejected or some part of themselves that they've denied or that they've repressed in some way. 
And in the vast majority of situations where people were throwing up like this, and this is another thing that people are just like, oh my God, this is, this is so bizarre. But I had so many people who would throw up on themselves and then they would rub it all over themselves in a state of ecstasy. And what was very clear energetically what's happening there is like, oh, this is beautiful. This person has just found a part of themselves that they were ashamed of and they hated. And now they're releasing it and they, they've realized that they don't need to hold on to it and that they don't need to keep it inside and that they can also love it at the same time and be in this state of paradox of, I don't want this, but I can love it. So sessions with me were often extraordinarily messy. I also often encourage people to bring an extra set of clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so 99% of people getting vomit on themselves was them vomiting on themselves. And even sometimes when they vomited right in my lap, people would take their heads and they would just roll around in it. And, you know, I'm just sitting there like, wow. Oh, okay. You know, just do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. This is what this person needs. Now, in terms of my own vomiting, um, and I think this is probably, I haven't gone back and rewatched the lamps video, but I think that this is probably in there. And if it's not, well then here's a new addition. Um, what I found early on in my practice is that on occasion, stuck energy inside my clients that they might not be able to release could transfer into me and I could throw up and they would feel better. And I always, this is, I had my throw up bucket. <laughs> so I, you know, throw up in the bucket, put it over there. And this was also something that I had to tell my clients that I would say, um, if I throw up or if you throw up and you get it into the bucket, I will leave the room and wash out the bucket and come back. And I always informed them of that. And I said that um, it's important to know that I haven't disappeared, mm -hmm. that I'm just going cleaning this out. And that's important because there's also times when people would be looking right at me and they tell me later, well, you just disappeared. And then suddenly you reappeared. And I said, well, this is not a case of that. I actually have left the room and now I'm coming back and I've got a clean bucket. So when I first started my practice, um, it was relatively rare that that energy would transfer into me and that then I would throw up for the client. Um, but then a couple years before I stopped, something happened. <laughs> and the something was, is I had this gentleman come who also had had a previous 5-MeO-DMT experience. And he said it was beautiful and wonderful. And he came to me, he was one of these people who said, I want the Martin Ball experience. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, so he came to work with me and he took a hit and he laid back down on the mat. And for me, balanced bilateral symmetry is very, very important. So I knew something was up because he's lying on the mat and then his head shifted to the side like this. And so that's an indication that okay, his ego is engaged with something that he's projecting out over here. Mm -hmm. Then he got up. So keep in mind the whole time, I'm just, I'm just sitting at the end of the bed. I'm not doing yeah. a single thing, just sitting there. He's looking off at the side, then he gets up and he looks at me and I've never seen this look in anybody's eyes before, but very clearly this man was coming to kill me. And he came up and he just started punching me as hard as he could in the face, just again and again and again. He was literally trying to bash my skull in. And I tried saying stop a couple of times and he just kept punching, punching, punching. And then finally I just said enough. And he kind of snapped out of it. And then he said, just get the gun and put it to my head and kill me. I don't own a gun. I don't know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. He's completely freaking out. And he's like, just kill me. Just do it. Just kill me now. Do it. Do it. Do it. And then his brother was downstairs. He, he ended up running downstairs and saying, well, I think I've really hurt Martin. We need to leave right now. And he and his brother left. He later contacted me and said that 
while, while his head was off to the side, he was in communication with something that said, to prove yourself worthy, you either have to kill the demon who is sitting across from you, or you need, or you need to let him kill you. So that's what he came up off the map with. This is high level egoic projection mm -hmm. stuff. And, you know, even after, I remember my face is, all, my lips cut up, I'm bleeding, I'm swelling up. And I just kept telling him, just sit here with me. Just sit here with me. There's nothing you need to do. Just sit here with me. He's like, just kill me, just kill me. But anyway, I had to take a, a couple months off um, at that point because I had to heal. I was, I mean, I've never been beat up like that in my life. But then something changed when I started doing sessions again after that point. Rather than uh, purging for just a couple, you know, occasionally purging for people, it turned into I was purging for like nine out of 10 of my clients. And I think it was an energetic protective mechanism that my body had adopted. This is kind of like, People have really difficult shit in them. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get it out right away, they might come after you. He wasn't actually the first person to attack me, but he was the first person to attack me at that level. And that actually was one of the reasons why I decided to eventually stop giving sessions is that it was, I was just throwing up for people too much and it was wearing me down physically. Now, out of all the times of all the throw up that happened, and also keep in mind that in these events, my clients would always thank me. And actually, many of them expressed feelings of guilt. They say, I'm so sorry that it had to come through you, but it felt so good when you released all of that. And so I really wanted it, but I feel bad that you had to do all the work. And I would tell them, look, this is just another day in the office for me. Okay, so it's, it's okay. It's part of the job. It's all right. Now, out of all the many, 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 many times that I threw up, there were a couple times where I threw up on my clients and they're mentioned in the video. Mm -hmm. So out of the hundreds of sessions that I did, I don't even know how many sessions I did. It happened a couple of times and the people that it happened to were grateful for it. So I, I've shared that because that's fascinating. I actually think that that's data worth knowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's like the weirdness of, of these experiences. I mean, I'll, I'll throw in my own sort of anecdote there, because just to sort of, to, to, you know, so just to show that you're not you're not alone here in in these weird, weird experiences, which I know you're not. But what you're describing there of you know when the kind of you know the throwing up and sort of feeling good about it and people smearing it all over the face, it's it's it sounds absolutely gross, and it, and it, it is gross. I mean, there's no getting away for it, but there is value to it in that moment. And yeah. again, I've, I was I was on an ayahuasca retreat. I was on a very, very heavy night, like one of the heaviest nights ever. And um, they ended up having to sort of drag me out of the maloca, put me in the, in the shower, and put put the, put the cold water on me. And I just felt my bowels just release and just like piping hot liquid shit just flooded down my legs, and it felt amazing. It was so warm, it was cozy, and it was totally gross. And luckily, I was in the shower, so I could clean myself pre off pretty quickly. But Weird shit happens in in these situations, and it's again you can't just like put it on paper, I think, and and say, look how freaky this is, because um, the context is everything. And that night was actually one of the most powerful, insightful experiences of my life. It just happened to end up in a particularly gross way, <laughs> but yeah. but still, you know, it was in that moment. It was, yeah, it, it, it sounds ridiculous, but it, it had sort of it had meaning and it had significance to me. So yeah, I think the, the the vomiting thing is something that's been sort of way overblown as as though that this is something that happens every every time, and that you know the, I think the phrase enthusiasm for it's a little bit tricky. Um, but if we can yeah, move on, and also go on. I was just going to say, and also kind of the framing as though I wanted to do that, and it's even very clear in the video that you know I'm mentioning that. My my internal ego is saying you can't do this. That mm -hmm. like, this is not right. You can't do this, but the energy of the moment required it. And so, it's not that I have enthusiasm for vomiting on people. I'm not looking to vomit on anyone. And it wasn't 
something is like, oh, I can't wait to get to the next person. So I can just throw up all over them that this is going to be awesome. Um, Because, you know, as I would always always tell people, no one wants to vomit. No, nobody enjoys doing that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we can move on to whatever. Cool. So the next one was was one that I, I got. To, yeah, I, I I I've struggled with with this one as to as to get the sort of rationale with it. And this was um, Martin mentioned shoving his thumbs down clients' throats to the point of gagging while they're under the influence. Um, now that that sounds pretty brutal. And I've, I have you know I've watched the the lamp clip, and it is pretty much sort of as you describe it that you sort of were pushing your, your thumbs down in someone's throat. And from from my perspective, my my, I, I like I said, I, I think my my ideal five meo facility is, is probably the other end of the spectrum from yourself, and that's not intended as any sort of slight against you. It's just you know different people have different needs, yeah. Yeah. and sort of I so I'm kind of always been in the school of like the facilitator is should be should not ingress too much into the experience, and again this is probably what some of the reasons why I'd issues with Octavio Rettig, he would very sort of inject himself into um, into that experience. So what what's the rationale be- be- behind the sort of the, the thumbs situation? Or was this just another one of these these random situations or how did you get the Yeah, well I, I guess I'll I'll introduce it by actually describing that what I would tell people you know, this is this is my end of the experience. Mm-hmm. Is that I would say, look, I'm actually not going to do anything during your session. That's my goal: is to not do anything. In other words, what what I mean is, from the egoic perspective, I don't have a plan, I don't have an agenda, I don't have anything specific that I'm looking to achieve or do with you here in this session. So I'm just going to sit here. And for some sessions, and I also told this to Symposia, I said for some sessions, there was zero interaction between me and the client. And I'm just sitting there the whole time. There's nothing going on. But what I am doing is making myself available to the energy that arises within the moment and allowing myself to embody it and act on it in whatever way feels genuine and authentic in that moment. And... So that does mean that many times, you know, and I'd explain this to everyone, and this was in the PDF, it's in my book, that I use my hands and that I would tell people, look, I might work on you anywhere along the center line of your body because this is your central column of energy and this is where people get stuck, Mm -hmm. is anywhere along this line. And I am here to serve you. And another way that I would frame it for people is think of it this way. Because, you know, we're working with 5-MEO DMT, which really dissolves boundaries. But what we're going to be doing is we are going to be working as one coordinated unit. Now, as long as your ego is holding on or resisting, then there's absolutely nothing I can do for you other than coach you. But if your ego drops, I will feel that. And then your body actually will reach out and use my body to do what you need done to you. And keep in mind, again, that this is not my plan. This is not me saying, oh, I think this person really needs their thumb, my thumbs down their throat right now. And the way that I describe it in the video, the way I described it in my book, the way I describe it to Symposia, is that for me, the, the clearest way I could describe it is that it felt like magnets pulling on me, where it'd just be like, oh, this person needs to be touched right here, right now. And also, you know, with the comments that people have made on Facebook from the people who have worked with me, you know, they have said, Martin touched me at just the right place at just the right time because he was so in tune with what I needed. So yeah, there was a few times where a lot of people, they would open and present their mouths, kind of like, ah, and I'd be working on them and I could feel, oh, nope, Ah, we're going in. Mm-hmm. And there were a couple times where that happened. I would also note, I don't think I mentioned this in the video, there were other times where people were sticking their fingers in my mouth as well, where they, they would get up off the mat and they'd be like, nah, and they'd be grabbing onto me. Um, so it was just one of these things. It was not common. 
it was rather unusual, which again, you know, I'm mentioning, these are things that are kind of unusual that I sure. wouldn't have expected. One time when I had my hands, when my thumbs in this woman's mouth, what she actually, she didn't need to gag or anything. What she needed was something to bite onto. And I found that out after I put my, my thumbs in there and she kind of clamped down. And I just had to say, gentle, gentle, gentle. And then she kind of slowly relaxed, slowly relaxed, slowly relaxed. But she, and then, you know, one of the, one of the ways that I kind of compare this, I'm not a massage therapist, but I think that massage therapists can kind of identify with this, that when you're working on somebody's body, and if you're in tune with their energy, you can find places where there's resistance. And then mm -hmm. you can also, you can feel like, oh, no, I'm being guided to touch this person here at this place. And actually, the energy is drawing me in. It's inviting me into this spot because there's something here that needs to be worked on. And that's the best explanation that I can give you. Oh, that's, a good, that's a good analogy. Yeah, it's I mean, that is that is the mark of a good, yeah, someone who, who can do sort of good body work. You can identify those those knots, as it were. And I think, I mean, again, it depends on on where somebody is in the community, how much they buy into the sort of, you know, the whole sort of energy work sort of paradigm. But I think, yeah. you know, when we're talking about something like 5 or where you really are talking about the, the complete disillusion of, yeah, what, what it means to, to be a sort of an everyday human being. And if you are in a sort of a, a close relationship with the facilitator, I can, I can get that dissolution you know, being between between the two people. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's one sort of kind of word there. I think it's just worth sort of unpacking because you, you mentioned it a couple of times where it was, you do what the client needs. And this was a word that symposium sort of latched onto where Martin yeah. needs to do this. And I think the there is the, the needs as as in as in like it can be framed in a way like I know what you need. I, you know, I, I right. you know, you, you are going to, it's kind of like, you're going to submit to me. I, I need to do this, but I don't think that's the, the way you, you're using it. It, it. I think you use it in much more of a symbiotic sort of way. And that is, it is yes. this, the, the needs of clients. So, cause, uh, cause yeah, I'd, I'd seen some comments like what, what he, he thinks he knows what, what he needs of me. And I thought, no, oh, no, it's not, again, it's like bad faith interpretation of, of the word, I think. Yeah, and it's and it's actually the opposite of the case that if you ask, like before a session, if you'd ask me, what does this person need? My answer is, I have no idea. We'll find out mm -hmm. what this person needs because that's what will organically develop within the course of the session. And like I said, sometimes all they needed was for me just to sit there and not do anything. And again, it's it's this feeling of this energetic pull, which is... You know, for people who haven't experienced something like this, I don't know if they can really relate to what I'm talking about, but it's just this feeling like, oh my God, this needs to happen. And that there's no thought involved. It's just the, I feel this energy. And so this is where I'm moving to. And this is what I'm doing. And then even afterwards, sometimes people would, would ask me like, so what was that? that you felt or what was that you, that you were working on? You know, they wanted me to have like a story or an explanation for them. Mm -hmm. And my answer always was, look, it's just where the energy was. And if you, the client, if you have insights into what that was, then that's great. But I'm not here to interpret this for you. I'm not here to give you a definitive explanation. I'm not here to give you, um, you know, a, a sense of meaning from this. I'm just, I am just responding to where the energy is and I'm acting on it in that way. And, you know, sometimes with, with the throat and with the mouth, sometimes that might be people who have trouble um, speaking honestly or speaking up for themselves or letting out what they need to let out. You know, um, sometimes I'm working on the forehead with people um, it was clear that it was people who tend to overthink things sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, working here in the diaphragm, this often seemed to be where most people were holding on to fear and judgment of some kind would be down in here. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's different correlations, but then there's also, and it's even, I mentioned this in the LAMPS video, that 
a number of people I worked on their throats. And I found it curious that there actually, there were several women who I worked with, I was working on their throats and later, you know, because we would always have a debriefing afterwards. People could stay and talk and we'd, we'd review whatever they wanted to review. And I also left it open that, look, if you don't want to talk about it, we don't have to. Sure. You know, so that was that was one of my things was that um, there's no expectation for you to sit around and talk to me about what happened. If you want to, we can talk as much as you want. Um, but a number of women told me that when I worked on their throat, that they felt the effects in their genitals. It's, that's just an interesting correlation. There were also times where I was working people on the front side of their body and they said, but it was actually addressing something that was on my back. Mm -hmm. um, so that there would be these weird correlations between different parts of the body, but it was different for different people because different people have kind of constructed their self-identity and managed their energy in different ways. So every person was unique in that sense. So I don't think that we can make like a, I don't want to too overgeneralize what is the map of energy and how does it work within the body because it's it's different for different people. Yeah, sure. And I think that's you know nothing particularly controversially. I mean, even in sort of mainstream psychology, we'll have sort of um, you know you're dealing with people who've got uh, certain conditions and there, there will be certain physical associations with um, you know certain parts of the body. I certainly I you know I sort of had problems dealing with grief and it manifested very viscerally as like a, 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 yeah, a literal feeling of blockage sort of here. And, you know, th this is one of the reasons I, I did so many sort of ayahuasca retreats is because you do that feeling of purging it out does, you, you feel like that, that, that blockage is being reached. You're pulling all that sort of grief and trauma into one place and then fire it all out. So, and you know, and again, if we sort of, if we, take away from the kind of the, the shock horror value of, of the video i think we can probably find in uh you know different psychotherapies or different parts of psychedelic culture a, a lot of sort of parallels here which people can can relate to but let's if we, if we go on to the sort of the next one which was the the topic around uh tongues so um forcing tongues in I'll, I'll, I'll use the, the sort of phrase here from symposia ball recounts an occasion where he lay on top of an unresponsive woman and forced his tongue into her mouth while she was under the influence and had stopped breathing well that sounds pretty grim um well yeah um i guess i guess like this the visceral reaction around this one is that there is a a line that is crossed here into someone's kind of personal space but i guess in the context of what we just discussed it's it's more or less going to be the same but would you want to flesh that one out as to what what was what was going on there yeah so this was the example of the 79 year old woman and you know as i mentioned in the talk at um lamps that it's actually common for people to hold their breath for extended periods of time mm -hmm. sometimes surprising periods of time um I would want to note that in this case, this woman, she wasn't turning blue. You know, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't any particular presentation that made me think, oh shit. It was actually the feeling. Again, I'm taking 5-MeO with my clients and something felt distinctly different in this moment. You know, I've had lots of people go all the way out and come all the way back in. Mm -hmm. So I'm very familiar with that. But this just felt like, whoa, I think she's not planning to come back. That was the feeling. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, her mouth was kind of, uh, and her tongue was kind of sticking out a little bit. And in that moment, again, this is not like, hmm, what should I do about this? What would be the best course of action? It was just, no, this is it. And to, even to use the language, I forced my tongue into her mouth. I mean, that is completely inaccurate. Her mouth was open. What I did is I took the tip of my tongue and I pressed it against the tip of her tongue. And then I pressed in just a little bit. And while doing that, I was just kind of breathing into her and I was lying on top of her because sometimes this physical contact is very important, especially uh, with 
people have some kind of breathing issue. Lots of people hyperventilate also, mm -hmm. as well as they, or they, <sighs> you know, they get into this pattern. And what I found is that simply pressing my body on theirs and that they can feel my relaxed heart rate and my relaxed breathing, that it is soothing. So I'm lying on top of her and I just press my tongue into her mouth and I just kind of blew into her. And shortly thereafter, her tongue kind of pushed back against mine. And that was the first response. And then it just felt like, oh, okay, she's fine. Can so I, just I, ask, I suppose the question that sort of most people would ask her is, is, is why your tongue? Why, why not sort of just poke with a finger or, or something else? Because, you know, there is a, a connotation of sort of intimacy there around tongue to tongue contact. So, uh, yeah, why, why choose that particular sort of method of contact? Um, the only answer I can give you is because that just is what felt needed to happen in that mm -hmm. moment. Again, it's it's not a it's not a decision. It's, it's not, not a rush. Like, yeah, it's not yeah. A, it's not like well, should I mean another option is I could have tried giving her CPR. I suppose I could have tried doing compressions on her chest. That's just what felt like. No, actually, this is this is all she needs. Just this very gentle touch, and it was my tongue. So, I mean, there's not much more that I can say about it than that. And that then she started breathing and uh, then she came back two more times. And like I said earlier, that she considered it to be her pre 80th birthday present to herself. And, you know, one of the things that Symposia asked me is like, well, did you call emergency services? And I said, well, no, because I mean, the whole thing happened just over the span of a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if say I were there and she didn't respond, absolutely I would have called 911. Mm -hmm. But she was fine. And we continued on with the session. She did not need any medical attention. So, um, you know, it's again, I, I, because people have asked me, well, has anybody ever had any health issues? Has anybody, you know, needed hospitalization? And my answer has always been no. But for me, that felt like the closest anybody had come. But even there, we have to acknowledge that that was my subjective interpretation of the feeling of the energy in the moment. I don't, I can't tell you if she actually was dying, if she actually was permanently leaving and not coming back. Mm -hmm. That's just what it really distinctly felt like to me in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that was just the response that I had. Yeah, I mean, as, uh, it's, it's one I, I kind of, I, I do struggle with because again, it's it's there's the black and white sort of version, and I can completely appreciate everything you're saying, and um, that you know you're entering into a sort of, for want of a better term, a, a contract where shit gets weird. Just it's yeah. you know there's, it's just a relation, and and I think yeah, if 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 I if I wanted that Martin Ball experience and I came to you for, for that Martin Ball experience and I knew what I was getting to and again, I, it was be completely consensual and that's what we'd sort of, it was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm agreed. Let, let's see where the medicine takes us. Then I think that's completely fair, but I, I, I am, I, on the other hand, I can, you know, I was thinking, God, what would what you do if this was me? I was, I don't know, I've, I've, just, I've come to sort of trip out on 5MEO and then I wake up, this dude's got his tongue in my face, but... Yeah, it, it's. I, th I think this is just. It's hard for me to disassociate the again the the horror story that as it's been presented with the. I, I think the open honesty of 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 what, of what you're the situation is, as you're describing it, which again I, yeah. I've I've had some some equally weird shit going on 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 any of the you know retreats and stuff I've been on. Probably not quite as I, weird, but. <laughs> no, and you know if I were to make a guess, and this this is just a guess because. I do not know, and I'm perfectly willing to admit that, but I think that actually it was the intimacy of the tongue to tongue that brought her back. That, mm -hmm. oh, like, here's a really intimate sensation that actually pulled her back into her awareness in her body. But that's a guess. I don't know. I think there's, there's there's something here, and I'm, I'm hopefully I don't blunder this as I kind of blurt it out. But there, 
when we're in the, these kinds, of, particularly with, with 5MEO, which is just so sort of top down dissolving of, of kind of of everything, then yeah, word where does your your identity, your humanness, your isness, your sexuality, these things just splurge into one thing instantly. And again, it, it's very hard for, I think, for people who, who've not had that experience to, to, to recognize that we're not just talking complete bullshit <laughs> here. But that, that kind of, that is, is the experience. And if you are, you know, if the thing you are trying to re resolve or the thing or the, the, the place where you're sort of your blockage is, you know, it, it could be something that's either, you know, seen as in a, in a kind of a, a very, you know, intimate area or something like that. But if that's what you need, then that is what you need. And, and it's, it kind of ties in with, with the vomit thing. Sometimes it, it doesn't matter in that moment. It just doesn't, you, what, what goes down is what goes down. So to, to sort of pull it out as a, as a little sort of example and just, sort of throw it on the, in the middle of the floor and say, oh, look at that. It's just so fucking weird. Just, just oh, that's just, you know, I, I, it, that's what kind of kind of rubbed me up a, a bit wrong about the way that symposium pr presented it. Because it, it it really was just this kind of hyper edit of, doesn't this just sound like a complete freakiness and just and then just throw it into the carpet, set it on fire and walk away from it with no conversation <laughs> or context. And, and hopefully that's, that's what I can do here. Um, so I think, I, I guess what I'd, I'd sort of summarize that, I mean, if, if you were going to ask me in, in the cold light of day, like, would I be sort of cool with that? Um, yeah, I, I don't think I could quite get over myself and say, no, I'd, I'd be completely cool with that. But I do, I, I can relate to the sort of the situation you're talking about. Um, so yeah, I think, so let's, let's move on to the next one, which is of, of, a, of a sort of similar vein, which is, it's basically the same thing, but it's, Ball states that in the context of working with people under the influence of drugs, sometimes he touches people on their genitals because that's what they need for spiritual and or therapeutic reasons. And I think that the frame in here is is pretty much the same. And it's, yeah. we're, we're kind of tapping into the shock horror of intimacy of our day to day intimate regions. Also, I think in, into the the zeitgeist of the moment, which is. Um, yeah, lots of sorts of sexual inappropriate behavior happening in lots of places. So, yeah, is there anything you want to sort of frame around that one? Yeah, so this again is something that happened a couple of times. I can't say for certain how many times. It's not like I'm exactly keeping track, but um, maybe three or four times mm -hmm. uh, where that occurred. And it was never, oh, let's go grab this person by the crotch. Actually, the way that it started um, would be that I would start with my hands on people's abdomens. And this is also something that I describe in the book in Theogenic Liberation, that what I would do is I'd put my hands on people's abdomens and then I'd press in a little bit. And what I was looking for is their pulse. Mm -hmm. And then their pulse might travel up the body and I would follow it up. It's like, oh no, they need something right here. Or the pulse might travel down. Most of the time we didn't get past this kind of top part of the pubic area where the pulse would go down. And so, you know, kind of above the genitals, but I consider that, you know, that's the pubic area. So it is rather mm -hmm. sensitive. Um, and, you know, to show here with the camera, it's usually my hands are like this. And so I'm just feeling that right there. And then these places where their pulse would be, there often would be like these knots of energy. Oftentimes, it was a very common description that people would give me afterwards where they would say, it, you know, it felt like the movie Alien, that there was this weird thing moving around inside me and you were chasing it and then you pinned it down and then it came out and I felt better. Mm -hmm. So... There were a couple of times fully clothed where then we moved past the top of the pubic area to maybe to the very top of the genitals. And then I'm just holding that there. And sometimes if it's like the lightest touch, like barely touching someone. So I'm here like this, just letting that energy release. 
and people, you know, their legs are open and, and they're and I'm just holding it right there, holding it right there, you know? So this is a place where, you know, people have been commenting on Facebook, like, oh, I don't want you groping and fondling me. And my response is, I never once groped or fondled anyone, nothing, that this is a complete mischaracterization. And this is what I told Symposia, that I said, it's similar to when you're getting a massage and that there is a point of difficult tension mm -hmm. and the massage therapist applies pressure to that point so that the energy can release. Now, on a couple, few, maybe four occasions, it involved people's genitals. And the vast majority of the time, it did not. Um, also something that I talked about in the LAMPS video, and I also shared this with Symposia, is that what was actually far more common, since they're getting into this, like, well, this is this, you know, what's sex, what sexuality is going on here? You know, mm -hmm. is this being sexual? Um, is that people actually would get up off the mat and try and have sex with me, or trying to initiate sexual contact with mm -hmm. me. I had a number of people come up and grab my crotch. I had a number of women come and straddle me. I had men come at me with erections. And my policy there was I would just sit there and they would, they would come and like, ah, you know, do this thing. And what I would present them with was neutral energy. So I'm not trying to push them away because I don't want them to react to the energy of rejection. Yeah. And I also don't want them to react to the energy of, yes, come and do that to me. It was just, you're being sexual with me, really? Why? And then eventually they'd realize, and go, whoa, and then they'd get off me. And that's the most sexual that it ever became in terms of interactions with me. Um, though, I mean, you have some experience with 5-MeO DMT, so you probably know that many people do get very sexual on 5-MeO DMT. It is not anywhere uncommon for both men and women to have full body orgasms. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, I'm just, I'm just sitting there. They're having their full body orgasm. It's also not at all unusual for people to take all of their clothes off on 5-MeO DMT. I had a number of people stripped naked. It's just part of the process. Yeah, there, there, um, there's nothing rational about, about that experience at all. And it's, I think, yeah, it, it, every, just every single facet of your kind of, what it means to be any kind of being is just, yeah, is just smushed into in, into well, I, don't, I think smushed is the wrong thing. It just it it joins and collaborates into into one thing. So yeah, there's there's no I don't think there's any boundary between the bit of you that that is breathing and the, the bit of you that wants to procreate and the bit of you that wants to have uh, you know an intellectual conversation or, or to be in love with its family. It just it, it's just. Bleh. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it just is. So I, I don't know how familiar symposia are with, with that experience. Um, if not, guys, try it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty fucking incredible. <laughs> so I think... Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so, so sex, on, se sexuality, sexuality shows up, but it was not something that was ever reciprocal within my sessions. And so to, to characterize me as like some kind of sexual predator is just completely it's it's just absurd from my opinion now people from outside they they can form their own opinions um but it's not a part of my practice yeah it never and was I, and i think that this is another one of those situations where we've we've got to sort of we've got to let and give sort of some measure of credit to the people who went through it and you know, and I, I, I'm sure you wouldn't mind me saying this, Martin. That it, it. I think you said it yourself earlier. If they're out there, then make yourselves known. But it's not. I don't think it's right for people to start um, pr projecting on on their on their behalf, saying, "Oh, oh no, this that that this is clearly sort of this is clearly right. This is clearly inappropriate." Um, 
yeah, I think in these kind of situations, the inappropriateness, it, it gets very, very sort of hard to define by your sort of day to day standards. So yeah. we've got to sort of, we've just got to, yeah, have a bit of good faith in in your transparency and also in the sovereignty of, of, of the client. Yeah. And, uh, and actually, something that I would just like to add there is that, um, with the original PDF that I would send to people when they contacted me saying, hey, I would like to have a session with you. Um, I would say about one third of the people who contacted me about having sessions, they would write back and they would say, okay, this, this doesn't sound like what I want. Mm -hmm. you know. So I kind of put it up front right there um, about that. And also another thing that I would just say is that I, it was also my practice to never once ever encourage anyone to have a session with me that my philosophy was if somebody asks me i will provide them with the information of how i practice and then if they choose to come work with me then that is their choice mm -hmm. but i was not someone who went out and ever tried to solicit anyone to ever do a session with me and even if someone you know in a conversation with someone if they were discussing something that it felt like wow i think maybe i could help you with that I wouldn't say that. I always wanted it to be the client's choice without any interference or influence by myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that that goes to that issue of it's their sovereignty. It's their choice. Yeah. Just just for you personally, is, is there somewhere where you think there, there, there is a line there? Um, like if... I'm, I'm not, obviously, I'm guessing if we went into the sort of the realms of like of, of, of murder and sort of knife juggling or something like that, then that would be too strange. But is there something like is, is there a line there somewhere, or is it kind of like within and within the, the confines of that safe space that you've created, you know, with, with the towels and with the, with the mat? And so, you know, again, there's no knives or hand grenades or guns lying around. Is is there can anything go then within that room? Well. Here's the way that I would present it to my clients is I would say, this is a space for you to go through and express whatever it is that you need to go through. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that you do not need to be ashamed or embarrassed or feel that you need to hide anything from me. And in fact, I would encourage you to consider me as simply another version of yourself sitting here in front of you, because that is what I am. Mm -hmm. I'm just another version of you. And within that, whatever you need to go through, I'm here for you. And it's very important to understand that I was there for the clients. And this is something that can be very difficult for anybody to understand who's had a 5-MeO DMT experience because the thought of, because again, I was taking it with the clients. And so the idea of what he's going to, he's going to take this to, and somehow he's going to be paying attention to me, like mm -hmm. client after client that I work with, one of the most common comments afterwards was, I don't know how you did that. That should have been impossible. But you were there for me for every single microsecond of my experience. You were there for everything that I needed, and you allowed the space for that to take place. And then within that, me as being the person serving, I had people screaming and yelling at me, you know, that because I would provide a target for them. I'm sitting in front mm -hmm. of them, and people would be looking at me, and people would tell me, you were my father. I like, was looking at you and you were my father. And just like, fuck, dad, you fucking did. You know, and so it, this was a place for people to let out what they needed to let out. The only person who really crossed the line. I mean, I, I had I had a woman try and kind of try and gouge my eyes out once. And there I had to, you know, kind of pull her hands away. Um, the only person who really crossed the line was a guy who was trying to kill me. Mm -hmm. um, and again, with people approaching me sexually, I understand that's part of what they need to express. It's not here to be received. I'm not here to participate in that mm -hmm. with them. But it really was a space where people, I wanted people to feel safe to go through whatever it is that they need to go through and know that my attention is 100% focused on them and also for their safety and to maximize the potential of the experience as the best I could serve them. That this, all of this for me was an act of service. I am serving these people, not just serving them in the medicine, but I'm serving them with my presence, with my experience, with my energy and with my ability. Okay. 
So there's, there's the final point in that symposium sort of mentioned, which I, I guess it, it might contrast with what with what you just mentioned is is a talk of um, your interaction with a Jewish client who. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, again, I'll, I'll read the, the line that Symposia used. Ball demonstrates complete disregard for the intergenerational trauma articulated by a Jewish client. In response to the client's comments about Jewish, suffer Jewish suffering, Ball states that his cli the, the client comments set me off. Uh, so this is you speaking now, set me off and I came and sat right on his chest and I just looked right in his face and I said, do not bring that kind of bullshit into my house. So I, I, just to sort of flesh out the, 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 the kind of the story here. Um, I think th there was a yeah someone who was a, had a Jewish heritage, and, and they started referencing the Holocaust or something like that, and and th this kind of trauma was was that the was that the overall gist? Well, I don't know if he was really referencing the Holocaust. I mean, I, I couldn't say that for certain because that they were not the words that came out of his mouth. But to preframe this. Um, this also, this was part of the PDF that I gave to people, and this is part of my introductory talk, that I said that what we're looking for here is to bring out your real, genuine, authentic expression. Mm -hmm. Whether it's screaming, crying, purging, whatever it may be. I said, but also part of that is if I feel your ego indulging in a story or narrative or bullshit to some capacity, mm -hmm. part of my job is to call you out on that. And so I would tell people, as a, like when dealing with internet, energetic knots in the body, I said, my method there is not to soothe you and make you feel better. My method there is to actually get inside where this energetic knot is and then release it from inside and that it can be physically painful it can be emotionally very tumultuous it can you can have a, a very strong reaction to that and i said in the same way if you are indulging in something that it's also my job to call you out on that because i'm here also as your coach i'm here to help you break through whatever patterns or narratives you've created for yourself are mm -hmm. so do I have anything against Jewish people? No. This was a case where the energy was, oh man, this guy is going into a self-pity routine mm -hmm. right here. That was the energy of it. it, was kind of an, oh, we Jews have always suffered for God, and oh, why is it so hard? You know, he was going into this self-pity. So pretty much exactly as they describe. And as I said in the video that, yes, I went and I sat on his chest and I looked at him and his eyes were closed. He's like, oh, and I said, do not bring that kind of bullshit into my house. And he opened his eyes and he looked at me and he said, oh, you're right. I am so full of shit. And then he just threw up on me all over himself. And then he went into this ecstatic state. And that's not to disregard his Jewish heritage. It's not to disregard intergenerational trauma. It's not to um, disrespect his religious tradition. I will also say that of the clients that I work with, pretty much every major and minor religious tradition on the planet was represented among my clients. This was something that he needed to be called out on. And that's all that is. It, and it could have been anything. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have anything to do with him being Jewish. That's just how the narrative happened to come out of him because he was Jewish and that's that's how he was framing it. But the point was that it felt like that's indulgent bullshit to mm -hmm. me, which is not to say that Jewish people haven't suffered. Of course they've suffered. Yeah. Many religions have suffered. And also, I have always been quite open that I am a critic of religion in general. You know, I, up until I got laid off because of coronavirus, you know, I was a religion professor at Southern Oregon University here in Ashland. The first day of class, I would always tell my students, I am an equal opportunity critic. I do not belong to any religious tradition. I am not a believer of any religious tradition. I do not plan to ever be, be a member of any religious tradition. And as far as I'm concerned, they are all open to various levels of critique and analysis. And that's the position that I'm coming from. Because just like in working with my clients, 
when I'm teaching a class, I want students to know where I'm coming from, what they can expect. And every time I would start to teach a new class at SOU, four or five students would drop based on my first talk. And then the rest of the people, just like with my clients, the rest of the people who were there were like, this is the most amazing class I've ever had. I, again, I kind of, I'm in this person, uh, position where I have to like brag about myself, but well, I you think know. it's fine, Martin, because I mean, th th this is the kind of the nature of the situation that that's been forced. We, yeah. we, you know, we have to sort of we have to counter sort of one narrative with another. So, I, I, and to be honest, if I thought you were if I thought you were literally bragging, I'd, I'd be sitting in a call in your internet saying that you're full of shit. But I, I, I again, I, I feel like I've done my homework here, and I, yeah, I, 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 I'm finding it hard to sort of to disagree with him much as it would make for a much more dr dramatic video on my part if i could go martin ball exposed as a fucking creepy is but you know i yeah i i, I can say that i you know i probably wouldn't necessarily want to go through some of these processes you're describing but i i i, I can't in all good faith disagree with your sort of with your rationale or the the sort of the evidence that's around you and, and i think in, in this particular case with with the around with the jewish clients i think this is one where I, I I've, I've got to say I really thought Symposium were, were, were reaching here because if this I I, I think what, what you say is completely valid and that if this was you know if we mapped it onto a different set of beliefs or something that's not as culturally juicy as um, you know a, a someone of a different religion or, or some minority then we, if we said oh well this was a, this was someone from the from the Ku Klux Klan. And they sat there and said, "Oh, we Ku Klux Klan, we're so, you know, we're, we're losing power, and we're, we're not." And, and you and you jumped in the yeah. face and said, "Keep that bullshit out of my house." Then, yeah, where's the story? There's no story here. It's only that that we can say, "Oh, whoa, it's, it's it's this is religiously intolerant." And I think we could, I could probably go and find, you know, a someone who understands these situations from a Jewish background who would, I mean, if we pick Sam Harris, Sam Harris is Jewish and I'm pretty sure Sam Harris would sit and say, say the exact same thing of, yeah, this is, keep your bullshit out, out of this. This is, you know, it's got nothing to do with this particular experience. You're, you're wallowing in it or you're, yeah. you're making a victim sort of mentality. Um, so yeah, I, I thought, I thought the, this one was, was possibly the biggest stretch, which I've got to say did make me roll my eyes a little bit at, the the lengths that we're being that we're being going to here um to yeah make this into something bigger than it was um but yeah i, th I think that's a sort of a, a valid sort of explanation to it i think i i, I th there's a, a kind of a i don't know if you've got any sort of comments here on like the on the bigger topic of what's have you got how how can we sort of have conversations like this because th there is this balancing act of um you know good ideas and bad ideas being injected into the marketplace of ideas in terms of, of psychedelics um you know there is things where like you know say shamans or i know i know you wouldn't call yourself a, a such shaman, but facilitators and there's a more general term have you know made some sort of you know some medicines and added some extra sort of stuff in or have acted inappropriately and there's been cases of people sort of dying so so there is got to be something where we where we can call out the bad practices call out the bad yeah. actors but Absolutely. then but then we've got to temper this against the sort of the the moral panic and the hysteria of trying to find the smoking gun in everything and that's how i kind of view th this particular situation and i think that's why i wanted to have this conversation and try and yeah, put this context around it because um, I'm I, I'm struggling to find the smoking gun here. I'll, 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 if you're listening, symposia, I really I, I am struggling to find it. And again, I, I I love the juicy drama just as much as the next person. <laughs> but it's it's I, yeah, I think we I think this is one where we 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 got to like I say ha have that ballast in our tanks of of rationality and. For the people who've been through these experiences, just just recount it to your own experiences. How weird shit could should get there. But is there anything that you'd want to sort of put around this as like a kind of a closing statement, Martin? Yeah, um, I would just bring it back around. Ironically, how all this started to 
Mark Hayden's book, Manual for Psychedelic Guides, that, you know, one of the issues they had was like, oh, Martin Barr wrote the foreword to that. And, you know, here in the foreword, um, you know, there's uh, some things that I have to say here that I think that they uh, would probably agree with. So that uh, the reality is that interest in and access to psychedelics in both the legitimate clinics and retreat centers and among underground practitioners and providers is growing exponentially around the planet. The psychedelic renaissance is well underway and it is transforming how we look at health, spirituality, religion, well-being, personal growth and development, and even how we think of the nature of consciousness and the nature of reality itself. In many areas of the world, there is already legal access to psychedelic medicines in a variety of environments and experiential methodologies. In other areas of the world, legal access to psychedelic medicines is fast approaching and will soon be a prominent feature of healthcare systems and increasingly in spiritual and religious communities. So just skip, skip ahead for a moment. Um, then in much of the non-traditional modern world, use of psychedelics and practices and concerns around serving and facilitating them in experiential modalities is something of a wild west, where there is little conformity, oversight, or professional associations with clear guidelines and systems of ethics and best practices. While this is due, to some extent, to the often illegality of psychedelics in many countries that have been saturated in misleading and unscientific propaganda around the supposed dangers of psychedelics, it is also due to the fact that many people simply feel called to share the medicine and have no training, supervision, or mentorship. As legal access to psychedelic medicines grow, we can expect that diverse methodologies and practices will still be present, but there will also be greater awareness around what exactly are not only safe and effective treatment modalities, but also what makes someone a skilled guide, what personal traits, psychological types, interpersonal behaviors, and interpretive modes are best suited to the profession. So, you know, it goes on to talk about that, that I think that this is a step in the right direction, this idea of a manual for psychedelic guides. When I was practicing, nothing like this existed. And mm -hmm. that when, you know, when we're dealing with underground therapy and underground practitioners, there's all kinds of wild stuff going on out there. I mean, and, and kind of like you're saying, if, if Symposia thinks that I'm wild, I mean, I know of stuff that happens here in Ashland that, you know, for even for me, it's like, yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't even have to go oh, to the, oh, the five dem, yeah. five MEO DMT for things to get wild. As I say you can go to you know, yeah. ecstatic dance or you know, there's a, a lot of you know, you go to go to the Netherlands for you know what is mainstream you know um, psychological sexual therapy, and that will involve a lot of sort of touching with sort of you know. Um, yeah, sort of proxies for for you to talk, but, but real life people and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I think as as these things do explode out into, into the mainstream, I think we have to get away from this our sort of limited concept of you know when when we see something like a, a nice clinical trial happening of someone sat in a bed with an eye mask on and and it's all you know the lights are dim and someone sat holding the hand. Yeah, that's lovely, but that's not how shit goes down sometimes. Sometimes it goes down in explosively bizarre ways. And if we're going to accept that these, you know, these compounds and these substances and experiences are on the table, then I think we're going to have to just, you know, broaden our mind a bit about what they mean. Because, yeah, I mean... I, it's it's not always comfortable to look at. It's not always nice and tidy. It's not that someone has a nice quiet experience and then just takes a mask off and says, "Wow, yeah." Sometimes it's yeah. it's what you described. And I've had yeah many experiences where not not quite as extreme as, as what was we described, but I could the potential was there. I'll put it that way. I I I get it. Yeah, so, and you know, I think exactly what we're doing here is what needs to happen is having open honest respectful dialogue and conversation symposia could have done that with me they chose not to they chose to create what i have termed psychedelic revenge porn in intermixing four different videos all together and all done in a way that was obviously done to create shock horror and disgust if they think that that is the method for producing viable conversation around psychedelics, then they're deluded mm -hmm. because that is not the way to go. That is, it. ironically, what they're doing is that I have made myself open, 
transparent, honest, available, and ultimately vulnerable by sharing all of these aspects of my own practice. And what did they do? They took it, they manipulated it, they distorted it, they repackaged it, knowing that it would generate levels of disgust. In other words, they have violated and abused me. And they're accusing me of doing it. They have done the very thing that they have accused me of doing. And that is not healthy. It's not respectful. It's not legitimate. I mean, the person who put together the video, it says on their symposia website that he has a degree in investigative journalism. And so one of the questions that I asked him was, do you feel that this video exhibits the highest standards of ethics and practice within the area of investigative journalism or not? In my opinion, that's just malicious slander. Yeah, it, it, I think it's, it's, it's not a, it's not investigative journalism. Yeah, no, I, I don't I don't think that particular example is is um, is, is helpful to the community. And I want to give sort of symposia a, a, a bit of a break here because I, I have watched some of their previous videos, and I, I do think they have done some really great investigative pieces. Um, so I, I was kind of a little bit shocked to see that kind of torn used and. To their credit, I think they've recognized this because literally about 15 minutes before we, we started this conversation, they have released a, a newer video covering the same topic, but certainly less sensationalized. And I think that's at least a step in the right direction for Symposia. Yeah. And I think I think what you know both you and I would be open to um, is yeah, I think let, let have the conversation, you know, be be critical, disagree with things. I think, you know, there is there is this psychedelic explosion happening and things are going to have to be worked out. And I think they they get worked out like this rather than, like I say, just sort of, you know, throwing down the turd in the middle of the carpet, set it on fire and walk away, sort of like, hey, look at that. Um, which is how I, 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 that might be an unfair sort of, you know, criticism of, of what their intention was. I don't know what what their intention was with that, but that's how it, I think it, it came across. And yeah, I, I think... Um, you know, I, yeah, I just I think it, they, they could sort of do better there um, while still having a disagreement. Yeah. Well, I, I think we've I think we've done a, a pretty good job of sort of unpacking this and having a, a sort of a conversation around it. And like I say, I I, um, I feel like I've unpacked some of my own thoughts around that. And yeah, and I would I would still say it's probably not for me, mate. I don't think I would want that Martin Paul <laughs> experience, but. I can respect that uh, not everybody wants the ayahuasca experiences that I need. You know, not everybody wants to go to the jungle. Not everybody wants yeah. to do cambo. Not everybody wants to do magic mushrooms. You know, there's it. Not everything is is for everyone. And I think we just need to sort of recognise that that's kind of fine as long as nobody's being hurt or sort of or violated. And I, I, I don't think that that that's the case here. So I think that's probably a good place to uh, to leave it, Martin. Um, I just like, to, you know, as always, mate. Thanks so much for, for for making the time and for your your sort of your honesty and transparency. Um, again, I don't I don't think there's a smoking gun here. I think everything that we've talked about has has, has been out in the open for a long time. But uh, I and I, I do appreciate that. Mate. I think I think a good honest conversation is is just yeah is is more of what the world needs. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, well, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it and enjoyed speaking with you again today, Rob.